today I'm going to be talking about uh, using your Colby index results, your Colby A. Hi, Jessica. Um, your Colby A to, to optimize your workspace, your virtual home office. So I'm really excited to talk about that. A lot of great uh, tips and strategies to help you uh, utilize your workspace that maximizes your problem solving strengths that you have. Um, so I think a lot of people are hopping in there. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, excited about this. Make sure, especially you fact finders, make sure you have your notepads out to take some notes because I will be talking about you um, and everyone else and uh, all the strengths as b best I can. So hopefully this is going to be really valuable. Um, so uh, while I'm waiting for everyone to dive in here and, and get settled and start watching, I'll introduce myself. My name is Michael Dickey. I am an admin of Financial Coaches Unite, co-owner of Fiscal Fitness Phoenix and the Financial Coach Academy with my wife, Kelsa. Um, and I'm also a certified Colby consultant. I've been certified since 2019. Um, and Colby, I'll talk about a little bit more, uh, and hopefully you've seen me talk about what Colby is. Uh, if you have not yet, in the guide section I have quite a few different videos um, talking about what Colby is, what it's assessing, what are some things that you can take away from it without actually taking the Colby assessment, which honestly is hard and is not optimal, but you can do it. I would not recommend it, and I do not recommend it, um, but um, you know, you, you can get an idea, I guess. Uh, I also have a full uh, Colby A interpretation with Sherry, uh, Andrew that's in there, and uh, some other uh, great tips for financial coaches using their Colby. Uh, at Fiscal Fitness, we've been using Colby uh, for two years for our clients, uh, and our, specifically our long-term coaching clients. We don't do it with our uh, discovery sessions, which we call a Eureka session. We do it with our long-term coaching clients. Um, but we want our coaches to understand their client's problem solving process so that, that the coach can customize the budget and the plan based on the client's strengths, not their own strength, right? Which is a big difference. So everyone's different, right? And we can talk about mindset, we can talk about personality, we can talk about values and coaching people through those things, which is great. That's a skill that we as financial coaches we need to have. We can also talk about the cognitive things that we teach our, our clients, like here is uh, a budgeting system. Here is some reasoning ability that you can use, some reasoning skills you can use to help coach your clients around how to pay off debt or the, uh, a budgeting system and that kind of stuff. But what we don't do uh, as far as financial coaching until we start to use Colby is understand our client's specific problem solving process. Um, and so this is, this is the new innovative thing. Um, in, in the world. Colby has been around for about 30 years, if not more than that. Um, but, you know, I think we're the first ones to really bring it to financial coaching. Um, so hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me. Um, and so that's the way that we've been using it with our with our clients. I've also been doing it for the past year uh, with our the financial coaches, uh, specifically in the symposium and in the mastermind, uh, and doing one-on-one -on -one interpretations with uh, coaches specifically in helping them interpret their Colby results and also see how they can harness their strengths, specifically their problem solving strengths, which is what Colby assesses, um, especially when it comes to the responsibilities of being a CEO and a small business owner, right? Which is, that's the real hard part about starting your financial coaching. It's, it's you can coach uh, anyone based on experience and that you've had personally or that you've gotten from training or certifications or courses or whatever, but it's the business part that can be really tricky. And because our natural strengths don't always line up with the responsibilities of a CEO or a business, or especially an entrepreneur, right? So um, doing an interpretation with me um, and helping everyone understand what their strengths are, but also how they relate to being a financial coach and more specifically an entrepreneur, small business owner, that's where the, the, the secret sauce really lies. So. Um, what I'd like everyone to do in the comments right now, either live or in the replay, hi if you're watching the replay, but if you've had your Colby A assessment done, put your four numbers in there so I can kind of see where everyone's at and maybe we can talk specifically about you. Um, so let me know your numbers um, and put those in the chat for me. So uh, also, uh, if you would like to know more about the advanced Colby interpretation that I, that I do with financial coaches, 
uh, I'll have I have the links in here and I'll put them again in the comments later for if you just want to talk like find out more about Colby if it's right for you that kind of stuff I have a Q&A link in there that just a no obligations phone call we can talk about it answer any questions that you have and also uh, if you do want to book that session the link is right in there too so I see that Stephen is an 8724 that's awesome we'll definitely talk about you Stephen um, so any questions before we get started please let me know Nikia, thank you. Kareen, merci beaucoup. Um, so let's talk about virtual office really quickly, right? So obviously, this is pretty obvious to everyone, right? But over the past year, um, a lot of us, especially if you're working, you know, a, a full-time job and you're doing financial coaching on the side, that you've probably transitioned into more home office, virtual office kind of stuff. Like this is, I mean, this is our bedroom, but it's also my uh, virtual office and it's our gym. You can see that right there. So uh, it's a multi-use facility. Um, but obviously we've, we've, we were um, virtual before virtual was a thing. Uh, you know, 12 years ago or so, whenever Kelsa started coaching people, we, she, we, she started at our dining room table. Um, and was only doing in person because really there was no there was no Zoom there was there was no video conferencing except for WebEx and it was not great right so uh, and then all of a sudden we started to see after three or four years that more and more people wanted to do virtual uh, it's more convenient for our clients they don't have to drive across town uh, and now that we're na you know national and international we're we're doing way more Zoom. Uh, meetings and so it's just naturally that we're we're almost 99.9% .9 virtual. So, uh, if not 100%. So that's the way that we've gone. I think that a lot of people have also gone that way too. Uh, 70 Slack, the uh, app that that we use for uh, team communication, did a, did a, uh, some research a little while ago and they said 72% of people surveyed by Slack said they would prefer a hybrid mix hybrid mix of remote and office work. They also found that working from home created higher levels of job satisfaction work-life balance and productivity which is amazing right so we i think that we all know that um working virtually is here to stay right uh and now especially with zoom and webex and google meet and all these other platforms that are out there financial coaching is trending towards being a, an entirely virtual business there's almost no reason to do it in person uh anymore just because of the convenience uh, and the social distancing in the world that we're living in right now. So uh, let, let's talk about how we can optimize and maximize our virtual uh, workspace from home. Michelle is a 9722, beautiful. Thank you for sharing. And if you're just tuning in uh, and you have your Colby A done, put your numbers in the chat there for me and we'll, and we'll talk about you a little bit. So quickly, let's reintroduce Colby. I don't want to go too far in depth because I've done it many times in other videos. So if you want a more in-depth uh, kind of debrief of what Colby is and it's assessing, it's in the guides videos under taking action in your financial coaching business. So uh, uh, Colby assessment is an assessment that identifies your instinctual problem solving process that you can't help yourself but follow. It's instinctual, right? It's the same way you do things every single time you're given a problem to tackle. If you're doing it your specific way to do it. Um, it's, uh, we're born with it. It's, it does not change. It only changes about five to 6% of the time in people, which is statistically significant and that it is, uh, uh, valid in that it, it's, you take it 10 years ago, you take it today, you take it in 20 years, 94% of the time it's going to stay the same, which is really cool. So since we know that we ourselves have to be obstinate in what we're doing and saying that, no, we're gonna do it our way. We're gonna solve a problem our way. We're not gonna do it the way that our parents tell, told us to do it. We're not gonna do it the way that uh, our boss tells us to do it. We need to be obstinate in doing it our way. Uh, and if you're in a position, whether you're in a full-time job or you're, you're a, a financial coach and you're working on building that business, we have to do that our way. But the problem is, is that the responsibilities of that role might be different. So we might say that Michelle is a 9722, but, uh, that two and quick start, which is the third number, also means that you, you're not an innovator, which is a great thing to be when you, you when you're stabilized, when you reduce risks, where you take calculated risk, right? That's a, that's a strength. But if you're starting out in your own business and you need to be a little bit more innovative and say the, the responsibilities of being a financial coach and a CEO, I need to be more like a six or a seven in quick start. Well, that's where we have these discrepancies because being a two 
in quick start there's no way that you can get up to a seven that's just not how it works so we have to be obstinate and do it in our own way right it's colby assessment is not a personality assessment like the disc or myers-briggs or strength finders or enneagram or those type of things those identify your preferences and values and motivations where colby does not it describes how we take action and how we do things unlike personality assessments which, which identifies what you want and don't want to do they also identify what you like and don't like to do colby identifies how you will do something and can't help yourself because it's your gut, gut instinct in taking action okay that's what we're talking about today so that's kind of the brief introduction of Colby and why it's different from a personality assessment, which it is not, right? Let's quickly talk about the four different action modes. And you can see in the comments, there's four different numbers that people are talking on. Um, and uh, basically, there are four different tools that we use to problem solve. And the higher the number, the more time you spend using that uh, strength or that action mode to solve a problem, the lower number means you spend or minimize time spent is problem solving using that action mode okay so um if any of these that i'm going to talk about here really quickly do sound like you please let me know so uh there there are th within each action mode there are three different zones of operation okay so let's talk about each of those zones uh and within the action mode and you tell me if that sounds like you or not so fact finder is how we gather and share information and the spectrum goes from initiating which is seven eight nine or ten accommodating four five or six and resistant or minimizing, which is one, two, or three. Um, a 10 is not perfect and a one is not a failure. These are all strengths, which is also really cool about Colby. We're all talking about your strengths. So uh, initiating fact finder, seven, eight, nine, um, yeah, seven, eight, nine, or 10. You research in depth, establish, establish specific priorities, dive into the details, define terms with exactness, and develop complex strategies. So that is Steven, that is Nakia, and that is Michelle, right? If you're accommodating in fact finder, you select appropriate choices, edit the details, specifically those that other people have found for you. You get the essential information and facts from other data that people have, have and research that other people have done, and you ask for specifics uh, from other people. And that is specifically Kareen as a six in fact finder. Uh, if you're a resistant fact finder, you summarize, you abbreviate, you take bottom line options, and you make exceptions. Okay. If you're in follow through, which is how you organize, you're initiating and in follow through, you design sequential systems, you're a systems creator. Uh, and really quickly, I want to go back to initiating fact finder of the probably 60 or so financial coaches that, I, that I've done Colby A's with. 60% of them are initiating fact finder and the remaining 40 are accommodating. And I've seen one resistant uh, fact finder in um, Colby. And, and it's amazing what she is doing for people that are probably also resistant in fact finder and don't need the level of details that initiating fact finders have. So again, use your strengths and, and use those strengths in knowing what other, your clients might want too. So when it comes to follow through and organizing, initiating as systems creators, they categorize and catalog items and get closure on a task before moving on. Accommodating, four, five, or six, package things together that fit, adjust procedures, coordinate schedules, take a pre-made system and maintain it, and resistant follow-throughs create shortcuts, thrive on interruptions, keep what you use easily to easy to access, and multitask, and that is me, I'm a three in follow-through. Quick start initiating, you race the clock, you do things on the last minute, you experiment, and you innovate, and that's me. Accommodate, make adjustments on the fly, mediate risk, respond quickly to challenges and sustain innovation and resistant quick starts, avoid chaos, stick to the status quo, reduce the chance of making mistakes and take calculated risks. Implementer is how you, uh, and I'm sorry, quick start is how you deal with risk and uncertainty. Implementer is how you use tangibles and space to solve problems. If you're initiating in quick starts, you tackle tangible products, you construct things that last, you deal with hardware and handling equipment, and you're a maker of some kind. So carpenter, probably a chef, um, uh, electrician, surgeon, farmer, that kind of stuff. If you're accommodating an implementer like I am at a five, you maintain tangible quality, you fix things that break, and you protect what has been built. Um, 
we restore things, right? We not, might not build it from scratch, but we restore things. And if you're resistant, which is about 60% of the financial coaches that I've come into, uh, you see solutions in your mind, you conceptualize what could be, be, and you make decisions without tangible evidence. You visualize things in your head. And if you think about why that works for financial coaches, it's because finances, this is my theory, but finances is a very abstract concept. And so we do things in our head with finances, right? Okay. So, Sorry to go on about that, but I want to have a con some context for everyone and frame of mind of what we're talking about and frame of reference for what we're talking about. So let's dive into each action mode and how you can organize your office based on your results. Okay. Any questions before we go on? Anyone? Oh, there's some more comments. Sorry about that. Cool. Um, yep. And then now Nakia says, I'm going to see two resistant fact finders because uh, you know I put my foot in my mouth every time I talk about that. So so when it comes to the, you initiating fact finders, here's what you need to do for your office, okay? Initiating fact finders need an appropriate workspace that is more traditional and former, so formal, formal. So mimic what a real life office at an office building would look like. You also need to have access to any records and data regarding your work, whether that is electronically or in paper form. So a designated place for those materials like a filing cabinet, cabinet or a bookcase is imperative, okay? You store items by priority. Right, so use a filing system that organizes by priority. Like the most important things, or the top priority things, are the most accessible, are the closest to the front, or they're 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 on top of your vertical file folder and that kind of stuff. Uh, and then the, the lower priority things are are further away from you. You learn by reading books or taking courses on the subject to make sure you have a dedicated place for your reference material, bookshelves. Uh, on your desk or up on the wall so you have all your reference materials in front of you. Okay, uh, let's see. Make sure also that you have plenty of notebooks for taking notes. So whether you are, you have yeah, obviously you can have a computer in front of you, maybe you're taking notes in a Word document or something like that, or you're using a pen and paper, uh, but make sure that you have uh, plenty of opportunities for note taking. Also, when you have extra time for questions, you will, I'm sorry, also, you will need extra time for questions because you ask a lot of questions and especially a lot of follow-up questions on what you've discussed during your sessions. Um, so if you are still working at a JOB, um, but also um, you know working from home and doing financial coaching on the side from home, from your virtual office, and you're still having meetings with your boss or your team at work, you want to make sure you know, you think about how it used to work when you had a meeting, you could say, hey, I need to ask you a couple questions before we leave the the room or the, the meeting room or whatever. That's not always the case anymore. So you need to make sure that you, you have a designated time at the end of a session so that you can specifically ask questions or that you end 10 minutes early so you can allow extra time for questions for you to ask of your client or your boss, whoever that might be, okay? Um, <laughs> Great, Jessica, good. She says, I have a computer and two notepads in front of me right now. So perfect. Um, okay, accommodating um, uh, fact finders, usually accommodating is you can do a little bit of both. So you might find some orga some of these tips help you, but also you might find some resistance might also help you. So uh, in, in what we're talking about today, accommodating, there's little to no uh, help for you, unfortunately, because we, we really act from our resistance or we act from our insistence or our initiation. Um, so we're going to skip right to resistant fact finder right now. So, um, so okay, I'm talking to you, but counteracting fact finders or resistant fact finders may need a simple, less formal or traditional appro appropriate workspace. Having access to informal electronic, uh, electronic stuff is always important, but you don't need detailed records at your fingertips. Okay, so just a little tip there. It doesn't have to be as super formal as you might think. Okay, let's talk about follow through and how you organize And those initiating follow. So your second number is a seven, eight, nine, or 10. Initiating follow throughs need a workspace with room for organizing all of their stuff and the accessories to help. File caddies, drawers, bins, whatever you need. Keep everything organized and keep your organization close to you. Okay. You also need a space that allows you uninterrupted time. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. It's best if you're able to have a dedicated space with a door you can close when others are around, right? Especially putting a do not disturb sign that you stole from the hotel right outside or make your own. Um, you store alphabetically. So ensure that your, your files are in alphabetical order. You do not do interruptions. Okay. If you have a seven, eight, nine, or 10, or even a six or a five in your second number in follow through, Think about how interruptions or you're working on a project and someone interrupts you. 
and that's like an, a, the worst case scenario for you because that you you're, you lose your focus, right? Focus time is very important for you. So make sure that when, you, when you're in the thick of working on something that that you limit interruptions as much as possible. A lot of time follow throughs procrastinate even starting to work on something if they know they will be interrupted during that focus time. So one, set boundaries with family and friends. Know that, hey, I'm gonna be in my office, I'm gonna be in the room, this door is closed, do not knock, I will be out in two hours or whatever that might be. Set boundaries, okay? Put up a do not disturb sign. Turn off your notifications and uh, email alerts, text, push notifications, anything like that. Anything that's gonna ping you, that's gonna take you off on a tangent to stop you from having focus time, you need to set that boundary as well. Think of your product projects not on getting something 100% done from start to finish, but how can you break it down into bite-sized pieces that you could complete and feel like you made enough progress to stop without feeling guilty and having that amount of closure? If you get to that baby step and you have more time, great, move on to the next baby step. But it's not always possible to go from start to finish in the amount of time that you have. So, so tackle those with baby steps, right? And really, literally write out the plans you're going to do. I'm going to get to this step first, and then that's a good closure point if I need to, right? Then I can get to the second point, and if I'm there, that's good closure, and then I can move on, or I can stop, and I can be happy with that, okay? You can also schedule interruptions and breaks, and those tend to work better. I still think that you're probably gonna push it off another 20, 30 minutes or so, but you can always schedule them. And it's better to have, you know, hold yourself to some integrity to take that break. Um, you know, you can snooze it, but then take a break, right? And another great uh, thing you can do, especially if you're still working at your job, uh, your full-time job and not full-time financial coaching business, is that you you put set your messenger, your group messenger for your job, set that status, update it. So I'm busy until this amount of time, I'm away, I'm unavailable, whatever that might be, okay? Also, if you're still working at uh, your J-O-B, your nine to five, make sure that management is standardizing procedures and that those SOPs are available for review, whether and online and easily accessible to you. So use Trello, um, Asana for yourself to keep those standardized, and uh, if you're having a you know your regular job doesn't have those, please try to get those the SOPs for doing stuff accessible for you. So maybe you just have to scan that or save the document or something like that and have it on your desktop. Okay, if you're a resistant follow through like I am, um, we need a workspace that has room for all of my piles. And if you, and if I could show you my desk, uh, you initiating follow throughs would probably throw up in your mouth a little bit and how it is, but I literally know where everything is under every pile. And, and the reason why resistant follow-throughs, I'm a three, resistant follow-throughs, if I file it and put it away, it is like it is gone. It's like it's like for us when you have an infant at home and you leave the room and they literally don't think you exist, exist anymore. That's what happens to documents when I put them away and I have to go find them. And I don't want to spend time finding them because I, that's just not how I operate. So. Um, Make sure you have room for all of your piles. This can be on the floor, a countertop, or using a rack or a cabinet that you can close to hide it all. It may look random to others, but that's how we roll, right? A ready supply of sticky notes to remind you of important tasks is also very helpful. Okay. Yeah, Emily says she hates uh, starting jobs with no documented SOPs, and that's very true. Emily, what's your, and you're initiating follow through, absolutely. So having those in place is very important so you know what the procedure is and what the plan is right uh let's see so also what anyone can do when you're acting against your natural grains and we can build habits to make us more proficient at that and that doesn't mean that we're changing our cognitive abilities as we're making we're making habits and habits are actually cognitive right so some things that i do as a resistant follow-through is that once something comes into my head oh there's an idea that i have I literally have to stop what I'm doing and I put it in my to-do list or I put it in my to-do list or I put it on a sticky note and I put it up here to know to put it into my system, okay? Um, set reminders, 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 reminders. If there's something that you need to do, stop what you're doing. The minute you think of you need to do it, go and set that reminder. Don't wait till later because it ain't happening, right? Let's just be honest with ourselves. Um, and then also automate as many of the tasks that you have as possible within a CRM. You can, you know, you can use a Dubsado or a streak in Gmail or something like that. We use ActiveCampaign, which is so robust. I, I would, 
I would recommend almost not getting it unless you have a team of people that can help you set that up. But, you know, using a CRM with reminders or automations, because then if you do something once, then down the line, there are these automations that happen that you don't have to think about implementing that, that, that task or that email that you send, right? Right. Um, let's see. What else? Um, when your uh, resistant follow through is in work mode, use the Pomodoro technique. You can Google that. It's Pomodoro is Italian for tomato. And basically it says you work for 25 minutes and you take a break. You take a five minute break. You back to 25 minutes. You take a break. You do that four times or so. Then you get a 20 minute break. It breaks it up. Um, you can go work on something else. It works really well for resistant uh, follow throughs. Okay. Um, we uh, resistant follow throughs. We multi, multi multitask. We work on different things at the time. We can switch tasks frequently, and don't feel bad about that. Okay, take frequent breaks. And if systems are needed to be built out, consider having a super buddy help you in financial coaches unites, especially ones that are higher in follow through than you, or outsource it and pay someone like Anna Natkins or someone like that that just all they do is create systems so that they can create it, you can provide your feedback on how you want it to be created, and then you can make it efficient on your own, okay? That's follow through. Any questions really quickly about fact finder or follow through? Put them in the comments and I'll, and I'll readdress them. Okay, when it comes to quick start and, and those and how you deal with risk and uncertainty, I'm a seven in quick start, so we're talking about me. Who, any, anyone else we're talking about? We're talking about Jessica and Corrine. So we're talking about you initiating quick starts. Um, so initiating quick starts, need a work, quick starts need a workspace that can be changed easily. Okay. With the ability to experiment with different, different configurations and be spontaneous. Okay. Um, when we need to brainstorm, which is what quick starts do, using a whiteboard, having that available so you can go post a note, you know, space on the wall, super, super helpful. Okay. Because we start with brainstorming, uh, and we're also verbal people that we, that we kind of diarrhea of the mouth, our ideas, just to kind of throw on the wall to see what sticks, start your process with brainstorming with someone else like a super buddy, right? Or excuse me, you can voice record yourself brainstorming so you can talk through your ideas and come back to take notes on actionable items. So this is especially when like Kelsa and I have a project we're working on. I don't take notes. One, because I can't write as fast as she talks, but I audio record it so that we can just talk through things. And then I go back and I listen. I'm like, oh yeah, what did I say? Oh yeah, I'll write that down, pause. Oh yeah, I'll write that down, pause, right? It, it works so well for initiating quick starts. Um, let's see. And like Jessica says, yeah, couch to island to dining room to yeah, a hundred percent. I do the same thing. Like I don't want to always be working at my computer up and up in this bedroom. I want to be down on the couch. I want to have some music on. I want to go outside when it's nice. You know, like we we'll change it up um, uh, when when we're initiating quick starts. Um, let's see. So initiating quick starts, set firm deadlines. One hundred percent important, especially those that have outside accountability necessary. For initiating quick starts, if we don't have a deadline, it ain't getting done. Okay. If I don't set a deadline, that's something that I can pause. I can push off. And at some point in time, we have to ask ourselves if we don't have a deadline as an initiating quick start, and we're, we just keep pushing it off. Is it important for us to do anyways? Is it something that we should be doing ourselves? Because we're procrastinating because either it's not important, uh, it's not high priority, or it's something that we don't want to do, right? And, or something that, I'm sorry, something that we don't do, not that we don't want to do it. We don't want to do it because it's something that we don't do. And that's the affective reaction, our personality responding to how we do things and or how we don't do things with our cognitive ability, which is what Colby is assessing. Um, so firm deadlines for sure. We store by color. And, and I didn't, I always struggled with like, do I really store by color? How does that work? And it took this past Christmas and the Excel spreadsheet I was using for buying Christmas presents for everyone, where I started to color code things based on the, where I needed to buy from. So Amazon was green, Walmart was blue, uh, Costco was red, like, you know, and, and it's like, oh my gosh, I do color code things. So uh, initiating quick starts need to color code things. So color coded filing folders or whatever can be super helpful. 
um, highlighters with different colors, pens with different colors for sure. Um, kind of setting reminders, countdown clocks, and checking with super buddies can be super helpful, especially when you're working towards a deadline. If we have a countdown clock, you know, going that you're looking, oh my gosh, I have five minutes to get this done, we're gonna get it done, right? Uh, we respond to challenges like that. Uh, and also when you're decorating, initiating quick starts, decorate with pops of color. Do some fun things, do some silly things. We're, we're kind of out there sometimes when it comes to that. Like, you know, I don't think a resistant quick start would wear this shirt that might give people seizures like I'm wearing right now, right? Um, you know, we I have fun pops of color. This is our bedroom too, so we got we have some bedroom stuff in here, but you know, so, some fun stuff, right? We, we like that kind of stuff, initiating quick starts. Um, okay, resistant quick starts. Uh, resistant or minimizing quick starts need to create a stable workspace and have plenty of notice if a procedural change is going to take place. Even seemingly little things like new furnishings or brand of materials might be a lot of risk. So if you like a brand, stick with that brand. You know, it's, it's that when something new happens and it's completely new and it's a change from what the status quo is, that can send um, resistant quick starts into kind of a, a down spiral of of um, uh, not of not being happy about that, right? Um, let's see. You're well served to set up your remote workspace to a, to be similar to what you're accustomed to in a traditional office. Okay, so that's a, that's a great tip for resistant uh, quick starts. Okay, finally, implementor. If you're an initiating implementer, which I haven't seen one yet, so Nakia, you're probably right. We're gonna get two or three initiating implementers in here. Um, but uh, if you think about it, these are the people that solve problems with tangibles, with props, with demonstrating. If you watch This Old House at all, those guys are 100% initiating implementers because they don't talk through things. They like build a 3D model. They demonstrate how it's been used. They they build a they build a jig. They build a, a sample of how it's been done. Um, you know, our our dog Storm had uh, ACL surgery in January, and um, I, you know, with my background in physical therapy, I told the the surgeon, the doctor, the vet after the appointment, I said, uh, you know, the checkup, I said, you know, I've been in physical therapy for almost 20 years. Um, and I've rehabbed thousands of ACL, you know, surgeries. Can you tell me just what how you do it for a dog? And she says, yeah. So I take this and wait, hold on. Let me go get a prop. Like so, she got the actual knee model, and she said, I went like this, and I went down and around, and so she had to describe that using a prop. So um, we need a workspace. Uh, initiating implementers need a workspace with a window that has room with a window for room for you to move around. We, uh, you know, initiating implementers need to see actual the real world outside and need to move around. I have a buddy from high school and he works for Harley Davidson. Um, and I was just talking to him this past week and he said that he, he set up his home office because they're all virtual now, uh, but he set up his home office in his 17,000 square foot garage that he has so that he can walk on his treadmill. If he's in a call, he literally goes and he works on his car or his motorcycle while he's in a call and he's listening, right? So you need high quality furniture, equipment and tools, especially a webcam that's high quality. Anything less is distracting to you. Stand-up desks and items to fiddle with helps. So fidget spinners, stress balls. I also think that that goes for accommodating implementers four, five, and six in there. Take breaks by getting outdoors for a quick walk or working on a physical project. Uh, and store your physical store by you store by physical quality and will likely want your high quality things close to you for easy access. Okay. Now I've never seen one, so we'll see if that happens eventually. But Nikia, we might the jinx might be on. Now, accommodating implementers, I have seen about 30 to 40% of financial coaches are accommodating, right? So we, and I'm a five, right? Anyone accommodating in here? So uh, Emily is accommodating, Steven is accommodating, everyone else is resistant. So um, we still need some interaction with tan the tangible world. So make sure we have a window that we can see. We take breaks to go for walks outside. We go do things, we, uh, you know, fidget spinners or, uh, where's my stinky? I know where it is, it's on here somewhere. I'm jinxing myself, but I have this teeny tiny, here it is. I knew right right about where it was, it's just under more pile. But I have this little slinky, right? That is super fun for me to play with while I'm talking to someone and I'm just playing with, or you know, fidget spinner or something like that. Um, take a break, get outside, accommodating implementers. 
Resistant implementers, finally, last one here, everyone, uh, need a workspace that enables you to imagine conceptual solutions. A temporary or a pop-up office space serves you well as long as you don't have to build anything. So it's literally the, the tangible quality of something doesn't necessarily matter to you because you, you need space for envisioning things. So um, places where you can sketch it, right? It's places where you can talk about it. Maybe a vision board might be helpful for you. Um, when it comes to actually the construction of, it wasn't Piles Makia, you're right. When it comes to the construction of uh, the actual things in your office, the chair, um, the desk, that kind of stuff, you don't be that person that builds it, okay? Give yourself permission to not be the handy person that puts things together. Find someone that's in your life that is more handy for you. Don't do that yourself, okay? Um, cool. So those are the tips. Let me know what was the most helpful for you, which one you're going to do now, which was kind of like an aha moment. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, Steven says at the end, can I give the, the advice to the resistant quick start one more time? For sure, Steven. Okay. So Steven, resistant minimizing quick start. So that's a one, two, or three in the third number. Need to create a stable workspace and have, workspace and have plenty of notice if a procedural change is going to take place even seemingly little things like new furnishings or brand of materials can be a, a game ruiner, like a day ruiner type of thing, right? So it just means that baby steps when you're implementing new things, I wouldn't expect that a, uh, a resistant quick start would go from zero room to buying everything new all at once from Amazon and having it all put together at once, right? It's kind of like baby steps. Okay, I'm gonna get my desk and everything else is gonna stay with what I'm used to, right? Okay, now I'm ready to move on to uh, a new chair. Okay, I'm gonna get the chair, uh, we're gonna work on it, I'm gonna implement that, I'm gonna start to use it, and then then I get used to that, and what's the next new thing that I can, that I can implement, right? So um, take things, new, introducing new things, whether it's a new procedure that you're doing, or uh, anything really, uh, and something new, it has to be kind of baby steps, like what about Bob, right? Um, you're well served to set up your remote workspace to be similar to what you're accustomed to in a real office, okay? So it's the new things, it's the risky things, it's trying something new that might be risky. You, you uh, Resistant quick starts are all about mitigating uh, risk and taking calculated risks. And if it's something new, you can't guarantee that that's gonna be risky, right? So um, also asking for help from other people, which getting consensus from other people on what they like, what chair do you like? If you're buying a new ergonomic chair, you know, you want to mitigate risk as much as possible. So look at the reviews on Amazon and then ask people in the group, which chair did you buy, right? We see those posts all the time, right? And that's helping mitigate risk when it comes to buying something so that we know it's not going to be crappy. We know it's not going to break. We know it's going to be, you know, the quality that you want. Okay. Jessica says, how do you organize your files if you're an initiating a fact, or a fact finder and a six follow through? I like to have top priority stuff close to me, but I don't like complicating filing system because I won't do it, right? I, I think you just answered your own question, Jessica. Um, so um, don't do that. <laughs> That's a crappy answer, I'm sorry. Um, so let's, let's think about fact finder. So, you know, your workspace needs to be appropriate. Um, uh, and traditional all at the same time, but follow through, you might need to find a system um, like, uh, I don't remember the author's name, maybe can somebody look it up for me, but Getting getting Things Done, I think is the name of the book, and that's kind of how to, how to create a filing system that works for you. Uh, that'd be something, Jessica, that you could easily follow and implement and kind of make your own. Uh, I start, I use that before I um, started, understood my Colby results, and what I found was, he says, you do this step, you do this, you do this, this goes here, this goes here. I mean, it was, it's a very good system. I'll be honest, it was a great system. But what I do is I say that it's, I just, it's too complicated for me, right? It's too many steps, it's too redundant. So I basically have taken probably three things out of that, and I just use that, and that's enough for me, right? But that's my resistant follow through. Um, you obviously, so, so it's, but yes, you love so follow that, use that. Um, let's see. Uh, does that make sense, Jessica? In a six follow through. Um, you know, I, I just I would just say you can find a system that works, 
but don't make it too rigid, right? You don't have to do things rigidly with your six and follow through. Um, you can you can have some piles sometimes, I'm sure, uh, but also having a, a good organizational system that is simple yet effective is really what you're going for. So what that might be, I don't know specifically, but getting things done is probably a great place to start. Yep, and you say too many steps in getting things done, yep. Uh, Steven says the biggest takeaway is not thinking of projects as needing to be 100% done, but taking baby steps that I can get done without feeling guilty about it. Love that. That's that's so good, right? Definitely. Uh, any other things that anyone really wants to um, uh, implement right away or some of the biggest takeaways? I'd love to hear. Jessica says, it does for to-do list, but not so much for physical files. Uh, and, and Jessica, what's your implementor? Two. Um, yeah, so active, passive, and research. That's a great idea. I, I think that you could do it simply. Um, I mean, it depends on like if you have client files. If you're doing things electronically a lot, which you might just be doing electronically, maybe you just, it's all electronic. You don't have to keep files. Um, so there, there's a lot in there and, and we can have more conversations about that to see what really works for you. But I think those kind of guidelines that we talked about today would be the most most beneficial for you to try them and see how it works. Um, but your follow through is, you're, you're, you're going to follow some systems, um, but you don't have to keep them so rigid, right? And you want things easily accessible. Um, I, I think those are the, some great places to start. So. Um, let me get back to my notes here. So, uh, any other questions? Any clarifications? I know Nakia says I have to listen to this again and make notes. I still get confused about the terms. Yeah, I know. Th those are the things. Um, it's hard, but remember that initiating is 7, 8, 9, or 10. Uh, accommodating is 4, 5, and 6. And resistant or minimizing is 1, 2, or 3. The lower the, the number, the, the less you use that in the problem solving process, the higher number. The, the more that you use that in the problem solving process. Amy says, I'm crazy distractible. It makes sense when you talk about my Colby 6762. I think I would do better with big tasks, not on my computer because my computer takes me down to tunnels. Yeah, true. Yep. So turning off all the potential tunnels that you might go down to when you're working on something, Amy, is probably best for your seven and follow through for sure. Uh, and you are a, a, uh, also have the strength of uh, a fairly high fact finder and quick start too. So um, you may want more of an appropriate workspace than not. Um, with all your stuff accessible, you know, your books is accessible too. Um, but yeah, don't let yourself get going down into tunnels and kind of um, uh, off track too much. Jessica says her biggest takeaway was same as Steven's. Good to a milestone, don't try to finish everything all at once. Yeah, which, which can be hard. Um, but it's it's the sense of closure that you need, and if you can get, you know, a, a mild—I don't know what the best word is—but but mild closure on or, or entire closure on one one baby step, that's still probably good enough than having to procrastinate and not start it at all because you know you're gonna get you're not gonna get that 100% closure. So I'm curious if anybody has found that with themselves, if. If especially if you know you're initiating follow through and that you need that closure, that that the uninterrupted focus time, if you've ever procrastinated in even starting a project because you know that you won't get to the completion that you think you need to get to, has that happened to you? Let me know. Um, so if uh, you know, let, let's talk about how how you do the Colby assessment. Now you can obviously go to Colby.com and buy it yourself. It's like fifty bucks. Um, uh, you can you can definitely do that. You just get the report, which is absolutely helpful. But the insights that you get from an actual Colby interpretation and and what you have to pay for that, on top of also getting you know the advanced interpretation that I do and the B, uh, you know Jessica and Amy and Corinne and uh, Nikia can talk about how valuable those those talking things through and how that actually applies to you is is super beneficial. Um, you know, I have to pay for the Colby A and the Colby B assessments too, and I don't make any money on those. So um, I, I, I just want to say that it's I, I'm not uh, in the business of making money off the assessments. I want to help you and I want to talk through things with you. Um, and that's where the, where the magic lies in, in the Colby assessment. Um, so if you really want to know what your Colby A results are and where the gaps are between your strengths and what it actually takes to be that financial coach slash CEO slash entrepreneur slash 
uh, boss, you know, you can schedule that 90 minute advanced interpretation link with me and I'll put the link in the comments and I think I put it in the description as well. Um, or if you just want to ask some questions, kind of find out specifically what you're going to get out of it, just schedule a Q&A with me, right? That link is in there. That's no obligations. I'm not going to sell it to you if you don't want to do it. Um, but, you know, it's it's an investment in yourself and knowing what your strengths are um, and how to use them. So um, I'd love to help you with that. It's something that I just love to do. It's, it's so energizing for me and the takeaways that people have said. Um, are, are so, uh, I think, life-changing and validating and exciting that it's worth doing because the good thing is you only need to do it once because we you, we know your strengths are never going to change. So that's the other cool thing is that we only have to do it once. Um, so any other questions? Let me see what other people have said. Um, Nakia said, I am always not starting something because I know I don't have time to finish it, 100%. Absolutely. Um, Michelle says, I procrastinate even long-term things because I know I don't I, I don't know how I will get them done. Yeah, so that's that's a great point, and I'm sure that's very frustrating, uh, Michelle. So make sure that you're you're a, 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 with your what was your score, Michelle? Nine seven two two. Yeah. Um, so um, with your seven, you're still you initiate first in fact finder, and you initiate and in follow through two. So if you don't get them done, you, that also that strategy time also includes research time first, right? So uh, that is there's a long time before you can actually enact things because of that. So make sure you give yourself some research time, Michelle, but also lay out a plan, lay out an outline of what you need to accomplish in creating that system and that plan so that you can tick things off as you go. And those those that outline that first thing is something that's a bite sized piece. I can get that done, then I can go on to the next thing. I know I don't have to do from A to Z, right? Okay, um, let's see. Jessica says, I totally read my report wrong the first time. She has a quick start, and the session with Michael was so helpful in making me see how I could t really take advantage of my strengths and save myself some mental energy, for sure. Yeah, that was a great session, Jessica. Thank you for sharing. Absolutely. Cool. All right, um, last call for quick questions here. Um, and... Um, you know, I hope everyone has a great weekend. Hopefully this was helpful. I'd love to know if you did find a great takeaway. Leave the comments. Uh, thank you for joining me. For those of you that are sticking around for these questions. And <laughs> Michelle says, yes, too much analysis paralysis. Absolutely. And there are some things I talk about in the other videos, Michelle, if you haven't seen those, specifically about paralysis by analysis. So make sure that you, that you watch those. But 100% uh, fact finder and that kind of combo of fact finder so uh, 7, 8, 9, or 10 in the first number and resistant quick start, 1, 2, or 3, that paralysis by analysis is that cycle of, okay, I got to research a little bit. Okay, did I mitigate risk enough? And is, do I have enough uh, um, uh, mitigation? I'm, I'm having a brain fart. But did I mitigate risk enough to move forward? No. Okay, I got to go research some more. Okay, now I got to find out how I can reduce, reduce risk more. Okay, did I do that yet? Nope, not yet. Okay, got to go back and research. And it's just this cycle we got to break out of. And sometimes it is so important that you just say, what's my deadline? I have a week to to research and then I'm done, right? Is this just good, is good enough enough, right? Um, having outside, outside accountability to say, yeah, I think you have enough. Let's try it. I don't think this is risky, even though you think it is. Let's just take a take a take a chance right and so some of those those strategies can be very helpful um amy thank you craig thank you michelle thank you <laughs> and nikia you are colby sisters i love it so uh and that's that's great that you that you can talk together and commiserate a little bit but you are clones of each other so actually if you're looking for a super buddy you want someone that's almost the opposite of that because they're gonna uh i don't think i was gonna say hold you accountable um but they're going to definitely hold you accountable, but they're going to see that other side of the coin for you that says, okay, uh, Nikia and Michelle, you're two in quick starts. I am a seven in quick start. I'm going to help you innovate a little bit. I, and then you can veto the crazy things that I say, but you can probably enact some of the safer things that I say, right? So that's how a partnership and having a super buddy that is opposite you or at least some degree of difference from you is super valuable because you're going to see the other side of the coin and they're going to help you um, overcome some of that silo that silo problem solving that we have all right everybody jose thank you nikia thank you everyone have a great day great weekend and i will be talking with you soon enjoy <laughs>